You can open your Bible back to Ephesians chapter 5, if you would. We're going to return to our study. I think the last time we were here was about April 14th. And so it's been a while since we have been in the book of Ephesians. But I want to get back to this, and I'm going to work our way through, because there is a lot here, a lot in this letter that pertains to us, especially in the day and age in which we live in. So what I'm going to do, since it's been a while, I want to do somewhat of a review. And as I do a review, there, and as I did a review on my own, there are things that come to my mind that I need to expound upon that I did not touch upon very much the last time, but uh, I think that they, God brought them to my mind, and so therefore they need to be looked at very closely, and you need to be reminded, and, and I need to be reminded of some of the things. We'll, we'll do our best to get through the notes that I have today. If it stretches out too far, I'll cut it off, and then we'll pick it back up, and we'll get it next week. But I want to start on 511, because that's about the area where we were the last time we were together. And this is the verse that I'm going to take and kind of expound a little bit here in a moment. It says this in 511. Paul wrote, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. In this verse, Paul warns about getting accustomed to and involved in the unfruitful works of darkness. In other words, we got to be very careful because we live in a society that is saturated with darkness, spiritual darkness. It, it is all around us. Every single day, you, it's like you cannot escape it. Listen to the words of an unnamed writer. This will bring it into a little bit clearer view for you. Here's what he writes, and I quote, Our magazines are loaded with accounts of sword crime, with our newsstands with concentrated corruption. We are engulfed in a tidal wave of pornographic filth. Television has put us in the dark with Sodom and Gomorrah, right in the living room. We get used to it, acclimated to it. We accept, as a matter of course, its art, its literature, its music, its language. We learn to live with it without an inner protest, unquote. So what can happen is, and, and I told you this the last time that we were together, you may not remember it, but I will refresh your mind. It's kind of like being in a brightly lit room and then walking into a dark room or walking into out, out into the darkness at nighttime. You are, once you, when you first walk in, you cannot see anything. But after you are there for a while, you kind of grow accustomed to the dark. And then pretty soon you can see around in the room or you can see around outside. Not the way you would if there were lights, but you can still get around. You can make your way because what you, do, what you and I do is we become accustomed to the surroundings. And the, the, the point to make is this, that we live in a day whenever we are saturated with all of this spiritual darkness that is going on, far more than what it was years ago, though it is the same darkness. But if we're not careful, what happens is this, that we grow accustomed and things that we should have no, absolutely nothing to do with, we end up getting to the point where they don't even alarm us anymore. They don't even bother us anymore. It's like we become desensitized to what is going on around us. And then the next thing you know, it starts to move in. And so we start to accept it. And the next thing you know, the people we know get involved in it or we start to dabble in it and don't even realize the danger of it. Watch verse 12, if you would. Paul says, uh, let me go back to verse 11. He says, have no, unf no, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but, why, but rather reprove them. Now, it's talking about in the, in the families of believers, in churches, okay? So listen, here's what we're to do. We are to watch out for one another. When somebody, we see somebody too close to the edge, getting in, into an area where they should not be, it is my responsibility and yours to go and to warn that individual, look, you're walking in a very dangerous area. And, and so we're not, not only are we not to be involved in the unfruitful works of darkness, and not only are we to re reprove them, but watch verse 12 now. He says, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. We don't even talk about them. We don't get in a group and we don't talk about them because what that does, and, 
And I think I read something for you from uh, somebody else the last time we were together. But it went something like this, that so many preachers will, will expose things that do not need to be exposed. And what it does is it kind of appeals to the appetite of the people. And it starts to stir their appetite and arouse their appetite. And so it kind of starts a process. We don't do that. There are things that go on in the world that you don't need to know about. There are things that go on in the world that I don't need to know about. And what I do know about, I don't talk about. And I don't get in a group and I don't talk about them. Because it says it's, even, it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So I avoid that. Let me, let me go a little further with this. Uh, Romans 16, 19. Watch the verse. The Apostle Paul says, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you... Now watch what he says. I would have you wise unto that which is good. Okay, so let, let me just take that for a moment. He said, I want you to be wise unto that which is good. In other words, to the Word of God. I want you to know what is right, what is righteous, what is holy. I want you to know that. You, gotta need, you need to be educated in those things. You need to be educated in the Word of God. But he goes on and he says, Wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. That means this, basically. Not educated in that which is evil. You don't need that. You don't need to go and study what somebody else is into in order to be able to understand it. You don't. You don't put yourself in that position. That's what I want to talk to you about. You don't do that. You remain simple concerning evil, ignorant concerning evil. We learn enough as we go through life. Before, before I was saved, I, I gathered enough knowledge about the evil world that I don't need any more right now, I can tell you that. And there were things that I, were, that I was exposed to that I wish I would have never been exposed to. But it's, it's irreversible. So I had enough of that. And I don't need any more. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying in Romans. He says, be wise unto that which is good. You focus and you learn God's word. That which is good, that which is pure, that which is righteous, that which is holy. You become wise unto that. But don't you dare take the same journey into the evil world. Into the, into the evil deeds, into the, 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 the uh, unfruitful works of darkness. Don't you dare get into that. We live in a world today, as I said, that is very dangerous. Very dangerous. It's, evil, is, evil is still evil. I know it was years ago. But the forces of evil have always been strong. But today there are many more opportunities there are, there are many more dangers around us. There have been many more avenues that have been made, I should say this, for people to be able to tap into the, the, uh, the darkness or to have the darkness uh, flow into their lives. There have been many more avenues that have been made uh, for that to be able to happen. And so... It is our responsibility to be very, very careful. We don't dabble with darkness. You don't get out there and you don't fool with darkness because I want you to understand something. Satan and his demonic spirits are far more powerful than what you and I can even begin to imagine. Let me show you something. Let's go with uh, 1 Peter 5.8. Peter says this. He's writing to people that are under persecution, and he's given them a warning here. He says this. He says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Let me tell you something. Satan is on the hunt, and you are the game. You and I that know Christ. He doesn't care so much about the people of the world. They're already going down the wrong path. It's us that are believers. He hates us because we're the body of Christ. He hated Jesus while he was here on the earth. Now we are the body of Christ. Now we are his 
ambassadors, we represent him. We carry the message of the gospel that saves people from their sins. So now the hatred is toward us. And if he had his way, he would destroy each and every one of us. We are the hunted. He is like a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Just waiting for you or I to get into a situation where we are exposed to the darkness, where we are exposed to, to the demonic world in some way so that, so that he can then, he and his demons, maybe not so much him because he's not like God. He can't, he's, he's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at once. He can only be one place at one time. But he's got millions of demons millions of fallen angels, an innumerable amount of fallen angels that are at his beck and call. And they will come. If the door is cracked open, they will come and they will step into your life and they will have a tremendous influence over you. You've got to understand something. The battlefield is the mind. Get this. The battlefield is the mind. So you and I have the responsibility of protecting our minds. And I don't want you to take it lightly. Don't you dare take this this battle lightly. You that have children, I don't care. Listen, you, you have children. I don't want you just to focus on them, though you need to, but you need to focus on you too. Because what better way to get the kids than to get the parents? And so it is your responsibility to guard your mind, to protect your mind, because that is the battlefield. Let me show you. Let let me go a little further with this. In Jude chapter 1, verse 9, I want to use this because I want to show you just how powerful Satan is in in his demonic forces. Now, before I read this, I want you to understand that Satan is the most powerful being ever created by God. Only God himself, only our Lord is more powerful. Okay, so whenever Moses died, we're going to cut in on something here in Jude chapter 1 verse 9. When Moses died, there was a battle over the body of Moses. Watch what the verse says. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil... He disputed uh, uh, with the devil. He disputed about the body of Moses. So, so here was the situation back when Moses died. Satan wanted his body. You say, why would he want the body of Moses? Because if he could have got the body of Moses, if you remember the angels buried Moses, nobody knew where the grave was. If he could have got the body of Moses... He could have indwelt the body of Moses, made it look like Moses was resurrected, just as he will with the Antichrist, when the Antichrist receives a deadly wound in Revelation 13, we read of that. He would resurrect Moses. And can you imagine what Israel would have done? They would have followed Moses anywhere. If he would have rose from the dead, they would have followed him anywhere. And so here's what Satan would have done. He would have led them directly into destruction. He would have had the entire nation wiped out. You say, why? Because from that nation would come the Messiah, and he knew it. He knew it. And so there was a battle between Michael and Satan. But watch what happens. Watch this. Yet Michael the archangel, when when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Watch this. It says, Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. What's that about? What's that about? It's about this. That Michael knew better than to get into a dispute with Satan. He would have been overpowered because Satan is the most powerful being ever created by God. He knew better. He knew better than to to battle with him. He just said, the Lord rebuke thee. Let God's power take care of you, Satan, because that's the only power that's greater than Satan's. And so I show you that because I want you to understand that if Michael the archangel 
would not enter into a dispute with him, how much more should you and I fear exposing ourselves to the demonic, to the satanic world, the world of darkness? How Just how powerful is that world, that darkness, if this is what took place over the battle for the body of Moses? Listen to me. The devil is not some make-believe character. He's not got a red suit and a pointy tail and horns and a pitchfork. That's not who, you're, that's not who Satan is. Whenever he was created, he was the most powerful being ever created by God, and he was the most beautiful being ever created by God. He's not some cartoon character. He is real. And he and his spirits, he and his followers, the demonic followers, would love nothing more than to gain access to your mind through however you would provide the opportunity. He would love nothing more than for your kids to get exposed to the darkness so that he would be able to control the mind. It happens all the time. I remember years ago listening to Dr. James Dobson on Focus on the Family, and he told the story about getting a call in the middle of the night, sometime after midnight, from a lady that he knew, and she said, I need you over here right away. And he came over, and he said that there were some teenage boys that had chose to, to stay in their basement for the night. They had a teenage son, and so the teenage boys were hanging out in the basement a sleepover. In the midst of that, somebody showed up with a Ouija board, and they began to play with that. They began to dabble with the Ouija board. You would say, that's just a board game. No, no, no. Remember what I said. You be careful because there are avenues, there are, there are, there are avenues that you open up with certain things, and that is one of those avenues. In the midst of that, one of those boys became demon-possessed. Dr. Dobson said whenever they got there, the boy that was demon-possessed literally picked the other teenage boys up and threw them across the room till they hit the wall. That was the power. That was the power. That's what happens. That's what can happen. But it's you get exposed to that. Your kids get exposed to it. And then you wonder, why, won't they, why are they going down this path? Well, let me just say this to you. Look, and I've said it over and over again. Parents, you got one shot. You got one shot. And the church, listen, the, it's your responsibility. You bring them here, that is for one hour of the week. Hopefully it's three times a week. But if it's one hour a week, that's it. The rest of the time is yours. And you better take the time to saturate their minds with the Word of God. You better take the time to pour over them in prayer. You, I, there is nothing, I'm telling you this right now, I don't care what you do for a living, there is nothing that compares to that. Nothing. You don't get another chance. You don't get another chance. You're better off going through life not having two nickels to rub together and having your kids grow up to know the Lord and to fear God and to have a deep reverence for Him than you are to grow up and make a million dollars but have a bunch of kids that, have, that are going out into the world and, and, and getting involved in who knows what. You get one shot. You get one shot at it. And I know there's times whenever this, I know there's times whenever it's like, boy, you know what, I'm tired. I'm tired, you know, and the kids, they, they're just, they're ricocheting off the walls. Somebody gave them a bunch of sugar. Yesterday we had a birthday party down at my daughter's for our little granddaughter. She was one year old and her mom gave her a cake and she could not pick the cake up so she leaned her head forward. And she ate icing after bite, bite after bite after bite. I just wonder what time they all got to bed last night. But anyhow, that's a side note. 
But I'm just telling you this. This darkness that is in our society, that is in the world, is a real darkness. It is a real darkness. It is those demonic influences are leading people to pass laws that say it's okay to kill babies. But we got to protect bald eagles. What's wrong with that? We, 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 we're not allowed, nobody's allowed to kill a bald eagle, but they can, they will pay somebody thousands of dollars to slaughter the unborn. You see the darkness? It's just that, 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 that doesn't make sense. And that's because that darkness is so strong and so powerful and it's, it's, it influences the minds of people. There are people today, and, and I've already said this before, they are, they are pushing forward that it's impossible to tell the gender of a child at birth. That's ridiculous. That is all satanic. That is all demonic. That's what it is. That's the push. Because Satan wants his kingdom. And so there are many people, anybody that he can get that will serve him, he will use them. Let me, let me show you. Let me go further with this. Okay. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 says this, for, for Paul said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, we don't use a sword. We don't use a gun. We don't use a baseball bat. They're not carnal weapons, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay, I underlined and bolded the words, the words strongholds. I'll go on because I want you to see something. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see it? It's in the mind. So the strongholds there, let me tell you what they are. They are fortresses. They are ungodly, evil, wicked thoughts and philosophies that people get wrapped up in. And they get wrapped up in those and they get entrapped in those fortresses. They get into a, they get into some kind of philosophy. They get into some kind of false teaching. And, and they get so in, in, entrenched and engulfed into that 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 no matter what you say, uh, you look at them and it's no matter what you say, it doesn't seem to penetrate because there is, it's, they're in a fortress is what they're in. There's only one thing that will penetrate that, and that's the weapon that we have, and that's the Word of God. That's the only thing that will penetrate it. That's it. But the point that I'm using this for is to help you to see that whenever somebody gets exposed to the darkness, the, the thoughts and the reasonings, they get entrapped to that, to the to the ungodly evil and in the wicked ways of the world. So as I said, there is such a need for you and I to guard our minds and to guard our families. There are the avenues today, television, books, internet. Be careful of the books, just the writings especially the internet, especially the television. It's pumped right in. Be careful. Be careful because it's real. So I wanted to use verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, or rather reprove them. I wanted to warn you because you need to be warned, and I'm going to say this too, that it is not going to get better. It is not. As it goes, as this world goes, I hesitate to use the word forward, but that's the way it's going. Forward towards Satan's kingdom. As it goes in that direction, you're going to see an increase. And there's, you're going to have to be on your toes. And you're going to have to be watching. And you're going to have to be listening. And you're going to have to pay attention that who, to who your kids are friends with. Because it only takes a, a cracked door. I, I told you this story too. I'll give you this and I'm going to move on. I'm passionate about this just because I see what goes on. But I worked with a guy years ago. We were at, uh, it don't matter, we were at Johnstown at the, uh, at the military base where the airport is. We were building, uh, I think they were hangars for Apache helicopters or something of that sort. But anyhow, uh, he was a good friend of mine, and he had three boys that uh, 
that he he and his wife were raising, and those three boys were outstanding wrestlers. Uh, the school that they went to, and, and we would often talk about that. And he said to me one day, he said, Keith, I want to talk to you about something. He said, you know, I've always guarded my kids. He said, I've always guarded my kids. He said, I made a mistake. I said, what happened? He said, my middle son got invited to go to a sleepover, and he said, uh, he said uh, my wife and I talked about it, and he said, the kids pushed back. The, my son pushed back pretty hard. He wanted to go. So he said, we agreed to let him go. And he said, I've always guarded him about what he was able to see on TV. And uh, he said he went. And he said, sometime in the night, the kid who lived where they were staying broke out the horror movies. And they sat down and they watched these horror movies. And it messed his son up terrible. When his son come back home, they had to eventually take him for psychological treatment because he was going through night tremors. And I, we got separated throughout time, and I don't know whatever, which direction that ever went. I've not talked to him for a long time, but I use that to help you to understand just something like that, something like that. I, am, I try to be so careful in my own life because it doesn't matter. You can be a pastor. You can, you know, you can be a deacon. You can hold a position. You can be 110 years old. You, we never outgrow the risk. Okay, so don't sit here and think, well, I don't have any kids. That doesn't pertain to me. Yes, it does because it can happen to you. Just like that, it can happen to you. And the next thing you know, you're pulled into it. Come back to Ephesians 5.13. He says, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So here's what Paul says, look, okay, don't get involved in that, uh, in the unfruitful works of darkness. It's a shame even to speak of those things. He said, we're to live as light. Go back to verse 8, the first verse that I read for you this morning. He says, For ye were sometimes darkness... But now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So he's saying this. Uh, look, we need to be light. We need to expose these things, not to get involved in them. And it made me bring up just a few passages. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Proverbs 4, 18 and 19 says this, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. The, the way of the wicked is as of darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Then you have verse 14. Watch this, Ephesians 5, 14. Wherefore he saith, based on all of that, watch this, Awake thou that sleepest. Wake up. Wake up. Open your eyes to the day that we live in. Watch this. And arise from the dead as Christ shall give thee light. Listen, don't get lulled to sleep. And that's what happens. A lot of people go, a lot of believers go through the world and, and they get lulled to sleep. Or this, you know, whenever you and I stand up for something, you get labeled as a radical or an extremist. Well, that preacher, he's a radical. He's extreme on that. Let me just remind you of something. Evil is radical and evil is extreme. So you better be ready to be radical and extreme to stand up against it. Otherwise, it's, I can assure you this, it'll steamroller right over top of you. It, you know, I, I look, uh, I got to be careful with what I say, but I look down at D.C. and I, I look at some of the evil that is down there and, and I, am, I am just taken back at the persistence of evil. Have you noticed that? It's like it, even if things get exposed that, and, and, and it's brought out right in the wide open and, 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 and the world knows, the, the nation knows that it's wrong and it's corrupt. And they, have you noticed? They don't stop. They don't stop. It's like they keep marching. It's, it's like the governor of New York. You know, you get caught in a situation and, and you have all these things that are brought out against you and, and he says, well, I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to leave the position. I'm going to keep on going. That's, I'm telling you, that is 
That, that is the militant style of the evil. That's why I say you and I have to be willing to stand up and to say, no, we got, and, and going back to this verse, we got to get awake. We got to get awake. Now, we finally came. That's a review. You just thought that was a sermon, didn't you? It wasn't. That was only the review. Now we come to where we left off. And we won't, I won't keep you too awful long. Walking circumspectly. I'll explain that word here in just a moment. But the, the, what I want you to see is this is all going to tie in with what I just told you. Watch, if you would, verse 15. He says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Let me go back. Let me just do this, first of all. Let me say this, that if you go through the book of Ephesians, one of the things that you notice is, is that Paul is concerned about the believer's walk. That's our everyday life. Let me, let me show you this. Okay, you got Ephesians 2.10. Watch what he says. He says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 4, 1 and, and verse 17. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, uh, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that, hence, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Ephesians 5, 2 and 8. And walk in love as Christ also, also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now you are children of light. Walk as children of light. Over and over and over and over again. Walk, 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 uh, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. So he's concerned about our walk. He's concerned about our, our everyday life. And now here in 515, he says, then see then that you walk circumspectly. Uh, Okay, here's what that means. It means exactly or accurately. If I could take Webster's, I believe this is the way Webster defines it. I, I have that on the next page. I wasn't going to go there yet. But, uh, but, it would, but it would be like this, and this fits so well. Unwilling to take a risk. Walk circumspectly. Unwilling to take a risk. What's he talking about? Just what we came through. Don't get close to the darkness. Don't live on the edge. Don't live dangerously. Don't do that. Don't you dare do that. I, I think back, you know, I was, when I was putting this sermon together, there were a million illustrations from my past life. Not, with the, not so much with the darkness, but just, you know, whenever you're young, you, you think that nothing will ever happen to you. And I think of some of the things that I've done over the years, and it's like, why did I do that? Only by the grace of God did I survive. I should have never survived some of the things that, that I did and taking chances and, and going out on the edge. But, but th that, was, that was physical. That was physical in the world. This, this is spiritual. This is spiritual. He's saying, don't take chances. Don't do it. Let me, I want to go a different direction. Maybe not a different direction, but down a, another way to help you to understand what he's saying here. So uh, I take Matthew 7, 13 and 14. I want you to watch these verses. Jesus speaking at the Sermon on the Mount. He gets them. This is like coming down and, and after he's talked about all the kingdom theology, he's going to present to his listeners a, uh, a crossroads and they got to make a decision. He says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Okay, so he's talking about salvation. And he says that, that there are two gates, there are, there, are, uh, there are two gates, there are two ways, there are two paths, and there are two groups of people. That's what he's saying in all of this. Okay, but then he explains something in verse 14. He says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Just hang on for a second. Let, let me say this. That gate that leads to eternal life, that is Jesus. He is the gate. He is the door. Okay, let, watch John 10, 7 through 9. Then said Jesus unto them again, verily, I, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came to me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and shall find 
pasture. So Jesus is the gate. He's the way. You don't get to God without coming through Christ. You don't do it. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. The way. Not one of the ways. I am the way. The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So he is the door. He is the gate. And he is, he is in, and if I go a little further, John or Matthew 7, 14, he is the straight gate. You say, what's that mean? That means narrow. That means narrow. The opposite of that is, the opposite of that is the, the wide gate. Now, let me explain the difference real quick, and then I'll get you back to this. The wide gate that Jesus spoke of, let me back up for a second. Okay, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. What's he saying there? He's saying there, is, there are two paths in life. One has a wide gate. That's the, this is the religious path. Religion will not save you. It's a way of destruction. The, on that wide path, the, those, that, those that walk on the wide path are people that carry with them all their sinful practices. They just, they're out there, they're religious, they go out in through the week and they live however they want. They get involved in their immoral lifestyles. They practice they practice fornication or whatever it might be throughout the week. Then they come back in and then they come into church and they think everything's okay. They are on the they are on the broad way. They have come through the wide gate. And they are on a path that is leading to destruction. The flip side of that is coming to Christ. Because his that gate is narrow. It's a straight gate. You say, well, what's that mean? And, and it means this. And and it means that to come to Christ, we are to repent. We don't come with all of our sinful practices and say, you know what, I want to come in and I want to continue to practice these. That's not the way of salvation. That's not the way of salvation. There has to be a repentance. There has to be a hatred for your sin. There has to be a time whenever you come to the place whenever you say you know what what i'm doing in my life i hate this and i don't want to be i don't want it to be a part of me anymore and you say i want what christ has and so you come to that straight gate and you come completely spiritually naked it's like a turnstile at an airport they're very narrow and you come through that but after you come through the gate then watch the next part narrow is the way Okay, so you come through the gate, and now, after we get through the gate, now there is a path that we, th that we follow, which is the will of God, that we follow through life until we finally end up in the presence of God. Okay? But that path is narrow. That path is narrow. That word narrow actually means affliction. But, but what I want you to understand, going back to what Paul says about walking circumspectly it means to be unwilling to take a risk in other words while we're on that path paul says stay in the center of it don't get out close to the edge close to the briars and the thorns and the thistles stay in the middle don't take a chance don't expose yourself to dangers that's what he's saying. Don't dabble with the darkness. Walk circumspectly. Walk circumspectly. Watch the verse again. Seeing then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. What's he talking about? Not as fools. Let me help you with that. How about Psalm 14.1? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They are done. They, they have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The fool lives like there is no God. He lives as though the warnings and the commands of the Bible were false. Like they don't pertain to him. That's just words on a page. It's nothing. He lives for his own personal desires of the flesh. Paul says, don't, don't you dare ignore all the warnings of God's word. Don't you dare. Don't you dare step out and take a chance. 
Don't you get off the path and get out into the darkness and into the briars and into the thistles and into the thorns because that is a way of affliction. And if you get out there, God's going to chasten you and he will get you back eventually. But he says this, that we are to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Wise people. Wise men, knowing that the warnings of God's word are real. They are real. And if we get out of line, there are consequences for us for getting out of line. Now, let me, let me go a little bit further with this. How about Matthew 7, 21 through 27? Watch what Jesus says. Some of the most frightening things, words, I think, that have ever been spoken. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, let me make something very clear. Jesus is not saying that we earn our way into heaven by works. The will of the Father is that you would come to know the Son, that you would come to accept Christ as your Savior. That's the will of the Father. Okay? So let me read that again. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Now watch this. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I want to stop there for a moment, and then I'll advance this. <clears throat> Jesus says this. He said, there are a lot of people that call me Lord. There are a lot of people that claim to serve me. They claim to have prophesied in my name. They claim to have cast out devils. They claim to have done many wonderful works. But you keep this in mind, that Satan is a counterfeiter. So he can very easily deceive people with what he does. Jesus says this. He says, in that day, on that judgment day, he said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Now watch what separates them from the true believer. Ye that work iniquity. What's that mean? That means you that live like there is no Bible. You that live like there are no commands in God's Word. You that live like there is no God. You that go about your life and you live however you want to, and you go out, you come to church, and you say, Lord, Lord, and you call Him Lord, but you go out into the world through the week and you do whatever you want to do. You live like there is no Bible. You live like God's word is nothing. You live like there will never be a judgment day. Jesus said to those people, I will say, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me. You that live that way. You that live that way. And I say this, as believers, we got to be careful. Because you can drift away, you can drift off the path and get into the briars and the bushes. And you can begin to live in such a way that you look like one of these individuals. You look the same. The consequences will come. You will not lose your salvation, but the consequences will come. And they can be devastating in your life. Let me go on. Therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine, let me get, I'm going back to what Paul says, walking circumspectly. Therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine and doeth them, he says, I will, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. Okay, so, so you and I, we, we, count, we know Christ as Savior and so we walk circumspectly. We stay in the middle of the path. We don't take any chances and, and, and we hear the sayings and we apply them to our life and we believe the warnings of God's Word and so we continue down this path and 
So we're like the man that built his house upon a rock and the storms come and the winds blow. But there is stability because we are resting upon the foundation of God's word. But then there's the flip side of that. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Listen to me. When the warnings of God are ignored and you get off the narrow path, you can expect trouble. You can expect trouble. But not just for you, but people of your house for your entire family. It's like I've often said this. When God chastens a believer, it's like throwing a rock into the middle of a pond. In the middle where the rock hits, it's, that's where the initial huge splash is. But then the ripples make it clear to the shore. The whole pond is affected. So it is in your life and in mine. That's why Jesus says, or Paul says, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, not like this guy that builds his house upon a, on the sand because you're not going to have any stability. You're not going to have any stability at all. Let me go to the next point and the last point, redeeming the time. And I'm going to come back. Next week we're going to come back and we're going to scoop up a whole bunch out of this. I'm just hitting the hot points right now. We're getting the icing on the cake. We'll get in down into the cake next week. Verse 16. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Hmm. Redeeming the time. Now, what he's let me let me tell you what he's not saying here. He's not calling on us here whenever he says redeeming the time. He's not calling on us to make good use of every single minute in life. Though, I'll say this, I will take that, and I will say this, that it is a good practice not to waste your time. But he's not calling on us to use every single minute of every single day and make sure it's all used up. It's not what he's saying. But as I said, it's good to use your time wisely. Watch John 6, 11, and 13, just as a side note. This is whenever Jesus fed the 5,000. It says, and he took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise the fishes as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Wherefore, they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above them that had eaten. There's an application there, and that application is this. Be careful about the fragments in your life. Whether they be fragments of time, whether they be fragments of finances, whatever they might be. Don't waste the fragments. That's what Jesus is saying. But here in Ephesians 5 and verse 16, whenever he says redeeming the time, he's not talking about using every minute of every day and making sure that nothing gets away. What he's talking about is this. He's talking about using the opportunities that come before you and me. Redeeming the time. Seizing the opportunities. When an opportunity comes up, when there's some way to serve the Lord, making that top priority in your life, not something else. That's usually not the way people operate today, by the way, because people have their own personal agendas. They have their own personal agendas, and they have their own personal desires, and their personal desires take top priority. They will serve the Lord if nothing else gets in the way. If there's nothing else going on that they want to do, they will serve the Lord. It's rare that people will sacrifice their time and their desires in order to meet the needs of others. I've often told you the story in my own life years ago when we were building our house. And I was, we were, I was pastoring down at the old church, Claysburg. Donnie Hohenstein's dad was in the hospital, and Donnie called me and said, Hey, Keith, this is whenever Mercy Hospital existed, so that's how long ago it was. He said, Dad's not doing very good. 
It was Saturday afternoon. I'll never forget that. My dad and I, my dad was still alive. He was helping me. We were building the steps to be able to get in our house so that we could come up to the front door instead of coming up through the basement. And so we were working on that. And, my, and Donnie called. And, and after I hung up the phone, I went out. I, I, I said to my dad, I said, look, we're done. He said, what, what are you going to do? I said, I've got to make a trip. I said, I've got to go to Altoona. I said, I've got to see you today. And it was prime day to work. It, the, I remember that. Uh, it wasn't all that extremely hot. And my dad was there to help. And I always enjoyed working with my dad all the time. Uh, and so I packed it. I said, let's just put the tools away and put everything away. I said, we'll get this later. So we packed it all up, and we, I, I left. I got cleaned up, and I left. And I got over there, and, and there was a whole bunch of people there. And Donnie said to all the people in the room, he said, everybody out. I love that. Everybody out. Get out. Give Dad time alone with the pastor. I wasn't in there 20 minutes. And Barry accepted the Lord as his Savior. Got saved that day. I walked out. I said to Donnie, I said, your dad just got saved, man. Boy, they, they, he was all happy. And the next morning, was next day was Sunday. That was a Saturday. I remember where I was at because I don't get there very much. I was standing at the sink washing dishes. I can remember when that happens. Not very often, but when it happens, I remember it. And the phone rang, and it was Donnie, and I answered the phone. And I said, hey, what's up? He said, Dad just died. Hmm. How easy would it have been to say, I need these steps to get in the house. My dad's here. I don't want to leave my dad. He's getting old. I want to work with my dad. How easy would it be to say, you know what, I got things that need to be done here. And I went. And that phone call would have came. It made the hair on my neck stand up that day. Because I think I thought back, and it made me weep because I thought I could have so easily said no. I just don't have the time to go. But for some reason, that day, God would not let me say that. But I say that to you, not to boast in me. I'm not doing that. I don't want you to think that because I've left opportunities get by. But what I'm saying is you don't know what the result's going to be when you go, when you drop it all and you go. You don't know. It reminded me of Philippians 2, 19 and 22, and then I'm going to let you go home here says, but I trust in the Lord, Paul writes this, he said, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state, for I have no man like-minded who shall naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. You know what I have found out in my life? There are times when... I look at things that I have to do, and it's like, oh, my. I got this to do. I have this to do. And if I go here, how am I going to get all of this done? I am amazed that when there is a sacrifice made, everything else falls in place. And honestly, there's less struggle. It just it, it falls together. It just clicks, and it kind of falls together because God's in it. And I say all that to you to say, you need to redeem the time. There are so many opportunities. Don't get so caught up in your own personal desires that you miss an opportunity to be involved for Christ. Ray Stedman says this, and I quote, These are evil days, not only because of the widespread fears, intention, and violence, but also because of the materialism that creates such hollowness and emptiness within but what is the result it is the evil days that make people want to know the truth about god it is the evil days that give us opportunity to demonstrate christian life therefore buy up the opportunities understand as you look at life that this is the way life is unquote closing psalm 90 mainly verse 12 but i'll read 10 through 12 Moses writes this, The days of our years are threescore years, 70 and 10, or 60 and 10. That's 70 years. So, so, so he says, so God may give you 70 years. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, 80, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, 
for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? And even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So, watch the end. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time. But, uh, just giving ourselves over to God. Jesus gave himself for us. And can't we give ourselves, and he, and, he, and he lets us live, and it's the blessings that come as we give ourselves and, and we serve him. There's a need. I'm telling you, there is a need. There is, listen, you go around in the world today and, and, and you see all these signs up that say, help wanted, you know, all kinds of work available just everywhere that you look. Let me, say, let me just say this. The church never hung one out, but it's been up for a long time. There are opportunities available. And, and Paul says to you, seize those opportunities. Don't let them get by. I'll, I will say this to you as I close, that there will come a day whenever you will wish that you had done more. I know that because I heard a pastor preach his last sermon one day that he knew that it was his last sermon. And you know what the biggest regret was? And he gave his life. He said, I wish I would have done more. Wish I would have done more. Let's pray. Father, thanks. Thanks for what is recorded here. Thank you for the warnings that are given about the darkness. Lord, help us to be sensitive to sin. Help us to be sensitive to the, to the, the works of darkness, the deeds of darkness. Help us to walk circumspectly, Lord, not getting close to the edge, not dabbling with that darkness. Help us to stay in the middle of the path. Help us to redeem the time. Lord, to use, buy up every opportunity that comes before us to be able to serve you. Putting others first, myself last. Help us to do that. Start with this pastor, Lord, I pray. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.